we would like to welcome everyone to the Echelon Q4 Top Pick Portfolio Conference Call. On the call, we are pleased to recap our performance and more importantly, focus on the names submitted for our fourth quarter portfolio and hopefully making uh, positive returns and better market conditions for everyone. But you will note that there is a tenor of caution um, as we all see the markets in front of us. So without further ado, we will just quickly jump into a recap of the quarter. You know, our focus on small cap high growth uh, once again uh, led to underperformance on the quarter with our top pick portfolio down by a factor of 9.9%, trailing the Toronto Stock Exchange small cap down by 2.5, the broader TSX by 1.4, and in turn the uh, Toronto, the TSX V by a 3.7 factor. So we are disappointed with the performance on the quarter. We remain with our commitment to high growth, catalyst rich names within our portfolio. And we continue to point to the success of that formula over the longer term. And we will point to our longer term performance numbers on the next slide. You will see here once again, on the three-year and the five-year performance to the end of the uh, third quarter, our alpha against the TSX, we have outperformed by 28% over three years. We have outperformed by 42% over a five-year term, while against the TSX small cap, the outperformance was 29% and 67% respectively. In terms of uh, the names within the portfolio, uh, we were you know, clearly hurt in our performance by Osino, um, off by 42.7%. And we were hurt by our exposure to air wellness, down by 47%. These two names uh, within a relatively small portfolio clearly had an impact. Turning to the positive, uh, we're very pleased to highlight the strength of Converge, uh, gaining 28% on the quarter um, to lead the way. And then we have Ammer in there with his uh, Ready Shred, uh, gaining by 12.7% on the quarter. Now we'll just progress in. With respect to the fourth quarter portfolio, we have one new name, that being High Tide. And we have Andrew online, and Andrew will do a much, much better service than I would in terms of highlighting the considered reasoning behind that submission uh, to the portfolio. So with that, we will just dive into the names. On the technology front, uh, Converge, uh, it's a long-standing constituent of the portfolio, has been a long-standing contributor to the portfolio, we are sticking with it. In terms of recognizing the current market conditions, we are placing a priority on the financial strength, the financial flexibility of our constituent companies. Converge stands out here for the quality of the name, the quality of its balance sheet, when it has roughly 98 million of cash on the books, 350 million of credit available for the company. We look for the company here to report accelerating organic growth. For the first quarter of 22, it reported pro forma organic growth of 7.2% that gained momentum in the second quarter, exiting at 8.5%. We look for a fourth quarter to exit in double digit organic growth levels. We note that the company is currently carrying a backlog of roughly 475 million of revenues. These are signed contracts where unfortunately supply chain uh, constraints have held back on their ability to deliver. We look for an easing of the supply chain constraints to allow the company to de facto flush some of those contracts through the reported results and to an extent in 2023, 
we will likely see something of an inflated organic growth level, which we think will be well received in the marketplace. In terms of its valuations, we take great comfort in that the company, if you look at its free cash flow, at the end of the day, that free cash flow per share equates to a 14% yield, give or take. That 14% free cash flow yield gives us valuation support and it brings the company options. Options to pursue a more aggressive normal course issuer bid, to institute a dividend where a 5% yield would use roughly one third of their free cash flow. It gives the company available resources to fund further acquisitions. This by a company who has made 35 accretive acquisitions since fall of 2017. So a quality name, one we are very comfortable with in, in an uncomfortable marketplace and excited about the growing momentum. In terms of our next name, Acquisitive Technologies, another long-standing constituent within the, uh, the portfolio. Market has not been kind to it over the past six months. It's down by 49% decline exceeding that of peers, converged down 30%, and soft choice down by 21%. The declines have no bearing on the underlying fundamentals of the company, and therein we see the opportunity. So investors are paying 6.6 .6 times the operating cash flow of the company, where converge, where we see it be being undervalued is 6.9, where peer soft choice is at 9.7. So you're able to buy this at 6.6 .6 when they have a, a holding in ledger pay, which is a, a startup. It loses roughly $4 million a year, has a net asset value of roughly 30 cents. So you're buying growth at a discount with Blue Sky Upside associated with their ledger pay payment platform which is just on the cusp of commercialization. In summarizing what Quisitive is, it's 90 cents per share as an IT services company with organic growth of 15%. It's 80 cents a share in terms of an independent sales organization with similar 15% organic growth. And it's 30 cents of blue sky spelled ledger pay or written as ledger pay. So in a marketplace that doesn't like some of the parts valuations, it's very heavily discounted. We could see the company taking investments at either the payment level or at the IT services level, which we would believe uh, would be very well received in the marketplace as a crystallization of value and as introducing a currency for the company to resume a path of creative acquisitions. So very positive on this name. Our third name in is Playmaker. And for those who are fans of um, soccer, a football, uh, the World Cup will be a clear catalyst for Playmaker where their core sports focus for content would be around soccer. Uh, this company is now has now been ranked, ranked as the number four digital sports media uh, platform across the Americas. So they have scale, they have 20% plus organic growth, they have profitability with an EBITDA margin of 34%. They have a very reasonable valuation at 7.2 times operating cash flow. They have a growing history of accretive acquisitions. They have financial flexibility and an exceptional management team. So a smaller name, but one where we are very optimistic over both the near term looking for the World Cup to lead to outperformance and over the longer term where 
acquisitions will play a big part of shareholder returns. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, on my end, we're sticking to our guns with Ready, Shred, and Kalyan. Um, and there I'll tell you what I say every quarter. We're always looking for how much upside do I have relative to downside risk. Um, so these two names aren't necessarily the stocks where I have the most upsides, but on a risk-adjusted risk basis, they screen best. Um, on Ready Shred, ticker KUT, um, since our nomination a year and a half ago, they're flat versus the TSX small cap index, which is good, um, which is down a good like 10 ish to 15%, depending on the time period you use. So it's not so bad. Um, our target price of 825 implies over doubling from current levels. For those who don't know the story, as the name implies, it's a shredding business. Um, so it's the secure bins you have in the office where you throw confidential papers, they come pick it up, shred it, and then they sell actually uh, the paper that is shredded. Um, it's a very high margin, high recurring revenue business. They've got growth both organically and on the M&A side. So all of the ingredients we look for in a quality operation. Where the opportunity is, um, the company trades 30% uh, below its pre-COVID highs. And we feel this is a total disconnect because it's micro cap territory and not a lot of people are paying attention to micro caps in these markets. And this is where the opportunity is. Um, what has changed since COVID is they've grown sales from $20 million to $50 million. And their EBITDA went from $5 million to $15 million. So they've tripled their EBITDA, yet the stock is down like 30% from their pre-COVID highs. Um, if I were to sort of speak to valuation multiples, um, Ready Shred trades at six times EBITDA. The larger peers trade at 13 to 14 times. Historically, Ready Shred did trade as high as 13 to 14 times. So at these levels, we think um, you've got good downside protection and tremendous upside. Um, moving on to my second pick being Kalyan, ticker is CGY, $85 target price. Um, if you look at the longer term picture, this stock has been one of the top performers in the small cap tech and industrial space. Um, it has doubled in the last three years, which isn't bad. Um, on a year-to-date basis, it's down 6%, which, you know, like relative to the S&P TSX small cap, it's underperforming. But if you compare it to any tech company, uh, it's quite good. Um, the quick and dirty overview um, on what sparked the outperformance over the last three years is the company essentially went from a steady eddy dividend-paying operation to one seeking out growth in a much more aggressive manner. Um, and that started with the uh, with a new CEO who joined in 2015, and he put together a plan for them to grow more aggressively. Um, in terms of what the company uh, does, it's really a diversified operation with four different divisions, mostly in tech, industrials, and health. And it's also run this way as separate entities with the same back office but each entity has its own sort of PNL, its own leadership, and so on. And why this is so important is they make very small tech-ins in each of these divisions and don't really need to risk the company by doing a large transformative acquisition. So they make a series of like 20 to $30 million acquisition, no trouble really integrating them given that it's different divisions with different leadership teams, and they don't really compete in trying to buy like these big ticket targets, which are typically much more competitive processes with higher valuation multiples. Um, in terms of valuation, they trade at 8.8 .8 times EBITDA. The comps are anywhere between 11 to 13 times. We think that 8.8 .8 times EBITDA is actually, you know, like overstated because their EBITDA is understated. Uh, because their balance sheet is under levered. So they're going to deploy a lot of capital into M&A, which will help their 
EBITDA performance. Um, so in summary, a pretty conservative and prudent built up of cash flows for this company. It's not a hot company where you risk losing your pants. Uh, we love the downside protection. We like the upsides. And with that, I'll pass it on to Andrew on cannabis. Thank you, Amr. Appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so first off, I just want to acknowledge cannabis markets faced another tough quarter in Q3. Um, our preferred benchmark, the new cannabis ventures global stock index, was down uh, 23.7% within the quarter. Um, in that context, our Q3 top picks um, were also um, detractors to our Q3 uh, top picks portfolio performance. And so in adjusting to those changes, we've, we've decided to uh, reshuffle our top picks and are bringing high tide um, to our top picks portfolio. In particular, we are very excited and um, hopeful and optimistic that the company's new discount club model will continue to deliver the exceptional outperformance we have seen over the past nine months. Um, the company's really wholesale strategy shift has allowed it to gobble up market share in the competitive Canadian cannabis retail industry. It has added about one percentage point of national retail market share per quarter, having increased its market share from 3.6% to about 6.6% in just nine months. Um, it has achieved same store sales growth of 46% year over year. That compares to the national cannabis retailer average of about down 23% year over year. So really massive operational outperformance. Um, and we see clear catalysts for this to continue in the future. Um, namely, the discount club model has not run its full course. Um, we see uh, the company continuing to open stores organically and via acquisitions. The company may, remains on the leading edge of Canadian cannabis retail. Uh, we expect it to, uh, as part of this, to launch the first ever paid for loyalty program called Cabana Elite. And we hope to see details of that within the coming quarter. And additionally, management hinted on the Q3 earnings call that High Tide is exploring entering an adjacent vertical uh, through an MA transaction. So we are excited to see what that might be. Um, we would note that the company's M&A over the past two years has been at roughly an average EV to EBITDA multiple of about four and a half times. This includes many store acquisitions at three to four times EV to EBITDA and e-commerce acquisitions between four and six times. And so we believe that uh, the company's M&A prospects continue to offer very accretive and attractive growth opportunities. Uh, so we look forward for new M&A announcements uh, to continue being a catalyst for this, this company. In terms of the valuation, high tide trades at 10.9 times their 2022 EBITDA estimates and 8.1 times our 2023 EBITDA estimates. Uh, we see room for those actual multiples to be even lower as the company has outperformed our EBITDA expectations for the past three consecutive quarters, um, largely as a result of the shift to this discount club model, which is gaining traction faster than we had anticipated. Uh, so with that, happy to move on to our next top pick, Verano Holdings, uh, which we are maintaining as a top pick for this quarter. We continue to view this company as one of the best operators within the U.S. cannabis industry. We view it as a high quality uh, in terms of its operations, in terms of its market exposures, in terms of its balance sheet. And uh, many of its key markets have begun to fire really on all cylinders. Um, we saw that as, as evidence in the Q2 results where Verano posted the highest quarter over quarter sales growth of its large cap peers at 10.8% quarter over quarter growth driven by New Jersey adult use sales beginning, which we were looking for as a catalyst last quarter. Uh, we continue to expect Verano to have a solid end to the year, uh, second half of this year, um, as New Jersey and as other key states within its portfolio um, 
continue to grow at above average pace, and we expect the company to grow at above average pace. In addition, the company is anchored by a very solid cash flow profile. We are estimating um, operating cash flow at 186 million for this year. Um, that's you know that's what represents a very healthy um, cash flow yield to the current enterprise value of about nine uh, percent. Um, next year, we anticipate seeing the company have a uh, converting this operating cash flow into free cash flow, where we estimate the company's current enter enterprise value represents a uh, ten point eight percent free cash flow yield on our 2023 free cash flow estimates. So a very healthy level for a company growing this fast. Uh, in terms of catalysts, we're looking for Q3 financial results um, to be a mover for the stock. Uh, this will include the first full quarter of New Jersey adult use data. And so we are anticipating this being a strong lift to the Q3 performance. In addition, in November, Maryland voters will vote on adult use legalization in that state. Uh, Rado is one of the largest operators in Maryland, so we anticipate that being a solid catalyst for the stock. Rano trades had an attractive multiple of 5.8 times this year's EBITDA estimates compared to the peer group average of 12.6 and the closest competitors or its closest peers at 9.9 .9 times. Uh, so a discount of 54 and 40%. With that, I'll leave that there and I'd be happy to turn over the call to Stefan. Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and good afternoon, everybody. So we're sticking with our same two names from last quarter, Quipped Home Medical and Diagnose. The reason is we think both names uh, have attractive valuations and, and upside from, from potential catalysts in the next few months. I'll start with Quipped, um, 11.25 target price, uh, buy rated. For those of you who don't know the company, they're a US-based distributor of durable um, medical equipment for at-home care of patients with respiratory problems. So think of things like ventilators for people with breathing problems and uh, CPAP instruments for people with sleep apnea. Uh, we like the business because of three major drivers. The first is strong demographic tailwinds from the aging population that has driven you know, consistent organic growth in the mid to high single digit range for the company. The second is that uh, we like to say it's in an M&A sweet spot uh, due to its industry structure, which is highly fragmented and allows it to benefit from uh, accretive M&A opportunities, typically paying under five times EBITDA prior to synergies for acquisitions. And at the same time, um, it makes them a target for a handful of national players um, as they are scaling their business and makes them a potential M&A candidate. And finally, is that there's just an undeniable ongoing shift to at-home care. Uh, which of course was accelerated by COVID, but it's certainly going to last beyond the pandemic because first of all, you know, you know, patients prefer it, but much more important uh, than that is that the, the payers such as insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid um, prefer it as well because it's cheaper to care for someone at home than in a hospital or a nursing care center. The key catalysts are for potential accretive M&A that could lead us to increase our estimates, uh, as well as the company's been having some supply chain issues throughout the year uh, with um, a shortage of CPAP instruments because of a recall from one of the major suppliers. Uh, as that situation improves, we think uh, that could be a, a po positive catalyst for the company. We're very confident in its growth tra uh, trajectory, which is in sort of 30% range, uh, largely because they've done some M&A that sort of has baked that in. And we think it's got a very attractive valuation for a company growing so nicely. It's trading at about five times next year's EV to EBITDA, which is a, a discount to its peers that are above seven times. And uh, m and in the space uh, earlier in the year that um, uh, where company got acquired for over eight times. So with that, I'll move on to Diagnose, um, a speculative buy rating, $1 target price. Diagnose is an artificial intelligence company with a platform to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is a leading cause of blindness in adults. It occurs when unhealthy blood sugar levels in diabetics cause blood vessels to grow on the, 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 the retina in the back of the eye and it leads to vision loss. The process is asymptomatic. You don't feel it happening. And the only way to identify the problem uh, is by taking a picture of the retina using a special camera that are used by eye doctors and grading the severity of the disease. 
Uh, Diagnosis developed an AI system that does this extremely well and efficiently. The model is a highly scalable software as a service approach where they charge five to ten dollars per diagnosis. So this is a win-win for eye clinics that charge 30 to 50 bucks for this type of test since it allows them to see more patients and uh, the doctors to be more efficient and focus on more valuable procedures. So there are about 450 million diabetics in the world, and they're all supposed to have at least one retinal exam once a year. So this is really a you know, blockbuster opportunity. Uh, the company has a number of partners using and piloting their technology. Uh, you know, that was derailed to some degree by COVID. Uh, and, you know, over the last year or so, they've been getting back into clinics and into optical retailers. Uh, but it's been slow going. Their biggest client is New Look, which is Canada's largest optical retailer with about 400 stores. They signed them on last summer and they're, and they're in the process of installing their software in all the stores. So while well, this is going a uh, bit a bit slower than we had hoped, uh, reviews are growing um, uh, upwards uh, to the right uh, and the, the company expects to be cash flow positive, uh, you know, basically uh, in the next couple quarters. Uh, you know, the company continues to be active on the business development front and is working on winning some meaningful contracts. And we expect that to continue in the coming quarters. The biggest opportunity, and I've been talking about this for several quarters, uh, is an opportunity with Essilor Exotica, which is by far the biggest player in the eye care space with over 15,000 retail locations. Uh, they announced a, a memorandum of understanding with the company last year, um, waiting on them signing a deal that we think could be a complete game change for the company. That would be obviously the major catalyst for the stock. And we think that those discussions are ongoing. Uh, Similarly, the company is is, um, bidding on a tender uh, to do um, diabetic retinopathy diagnosis for the province of Quebec. They're very well placed to win that contract. They'll be part of the winning bid for that contract. uh, uh, given that they're based in Quebec. So we think these are uh, potential catalysts in the next quarter. Uh, I'll end there. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to David Crystal, who's going to tell you about his picks in the, the real estate sector. Take it away, David. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Um, we're we're also sticking with a couple familiar picks from, uh, from last quarter. Um, both, both picks are US-based and play on the theme of uh, strong residential demand and lack of residential rent controls in the U.S., which allows them to quickly close the gap in an inflationary world and expand their NOI margins. Um, so just, just quickly to comment on performance, um, although both did generate slightly negative returns for the quarter on the U.S. dollar currency ticker, um, I would note they were both beneficiaries of a strong U.S. dollar, which put them both slightly in the positive in terms of total return. Um, you know, while we're not we're not picking currency, and currency doesn't really factor into our decision, we do think both names are well equipped in a in an inflationary environment. Um, one characterized by rising interest rates, which make housing affordability a challenge and really increases the number of households that are forced to rent in that environment. So our first pick flagship, we think, is you know an incredibly defensive pick. It boasts an all-weather portfolio of manufactured housing communities, which are essentially trailer parks. Um, but rather than being retirement or lifestyle type livings, th- these are very much workforce accommodation. They're located in the U.S. Midwest in blue collar states and are are very well equipped to weather the current macroeconomic backdrop. Um, It's the cheapest form of accommodation that you can find in the U.S. It is a fraction of the cost of buying a home, a fraction of the cost of renting your traditional apartment. And the industry as a whole has 20 plus years of positive organic growth across all economic conditions. And so obviously with the, you know, with the specter of recession on the horizon, with increasing talks of higher rates driving a recession, we think that this is a great defensive place to put your money. Um, Not only is the industry strong as a whole and very defensive, um, we also note that flagship's balance sheet is very well equipped for a rising rate environment. They have no debt maturities for the next five years, and their average remaining uh, maturity on outstanding debt is north of 11 years. So very little exposure to rising interest rates, while at the same time, they should see their cash flows increase year over year on an organic basis. Um, Finally, it trades at a very attractive valuation. 
Um, valuation on its own won't, uh, won't really sell you on the story because the whole sector has sold off. But in terms of uh, its valuation relative to the peer group, the U.S. publicly traded comps, um, flagship trades at a 42% discount to our NAV and 14 times forward cash flow. The U.S. peers are at a 22% NAV discount and 23 times forward cash flow. So almost a 10 times multiple spread on the forward cash flow figure for a name that is highly defensive in our view. And um, our, our, our second pick will uh, we'll turn to BSR. Again, a name that you guys should be familiar with. Um, BSR owns a portfolio of a part of garden style apartment properties concentrated in the Sun Belt, specifically in Texas. Um, the story of 2021 in the first half of this year was one of exceptional, unprecedented market rent growth, which allowed the REIT to grow their organic NOI to the tune of 17% in the first half of this year. Um, guidance is for double-digit growth in the back half of the, of the year, though we would note that market rent growth has slowed. Um, despite this, there is still a significant mark-to-market opportunity between 10 and 15% incremental NOI upside just from closing the gap that has emerged over the last 18 months. So again, as we noted at the start, with out rent control legislation in their core markets, uh, BSR should be able to close this gap over a 12 to 18 month period. This should translate into double digit NOI growth over that 12 to 18 months, um, which will, will likely be among the strongest organic growth profiles in the Canadian REIT sector. Um, and, and finally on valuation, again, across the space, we're seeing deep discounts in the REIT space. Um, BSR trades at close to a 40% discount to our NAV and 16 times forward F forward cash flow. This is about a 10 to 15% spread versus the US peer group on NAV and a four times spread on the cash flow multiple. Um, so again, trades at a attractive relative valuation and has a very strong organic growth profile. And we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. I'll turn it over to Ryan in the mining space. Thanks, David. Uh, so uh, again, sticking with the theme, uh, it seems today, uh, two returning names for us as well. Uh, first, you'll see there, Osino Resources. So you'll be familiar with this one. And uh, just a thanks to Rob for highlighting Osino as the, the leading source of undertow for the uh, top picks portfolio during Q3. Uh, much appreciated there. Uh, so with that said, you know, why is it a return top pick? Well, uh, I guess, you know, first off, it's already up almost 20% on the quarter. So we have that going for us. Uh, yeah, but we like the story. We like management. It's a solid project. This is a development stage gold project in Namibia in a mining region in mining region in Namibia, uh, you know, meaningful, meaningful production profile, uh, their PFS that they put out recently uh, outlines uh, production of about 200,000 ounces per year at low, relatively low cost for the first four years. So this, this moves the needle for, uh, for an interme intermediate uh, producer, uh, not that we hang our hat on, on M&A as the main catalyst here. <clears throat> and that's really why it's still a top pick. Uh, really catalyst laden in the near term, some major de-risking uh, elements coming up for, for the story. So just to go through the catalyst quickly, uh, the first and potentially the most impactful is a maiden resource estimate for the Undundu satellite deposit. This is a project they picked up from B2 Gold, their neighbor to the north. That management actually sold uh, the Ojikoto mine that, that they have up there uh, to uh, back in 2011. So uh, they have this project that they bought from them. Uh, you know, guidance is for about a million ounces at 1.2 to 1.3 grams. So a little bit better grade than, than their main Twin Hills project and potentially within trucking distance of that. So looking at future potentially co-development and really bolstering the project up to 4 million ounces, which is a, which is a sizable resource. So uh, again, you know, we're talking 200,000 ounces for the first couple of years now, layer in on Dundu eventually, and, and it grows from there. So definitely should, should be on the radar screen as far as M&A. Uh, in what could be a new uh, gold market bull run, uh, you know, into maybe the second half of, of 2023 or somewhere thereabouts, as, you know, everyone expecting this Fed pivot and for 
uh, rates to, to, to start coming down and, and that's always good for gold. So uh, we like that setup uh, for, for you know, the other uh, catalyst coming in the near term, again, project de-risking elements here is the acquisition of the surface rates at the main Twin Hills project area. Obviously want that tied up uh, to, to uh, on land that you're, you're expecting to put your infrastructure on. And then the other big thing is the grant of a mining license and environmental authorization from the government in Namibia there. So really all that goes to kind of having the project set up as a shovel ready project you know, the first half of next year, we don't count on on M and A. Definitely a possibility if the gold environment is there. Uh, and otherwise, you know, this is an off the shelf, relatively easy size project that that Ocino, uh could put in production itself. So, uh, you know, solid management, solid project, and a nice jurisdiction. So, uh, just on the evaluation front, you know, it's currently trading at about half the uh, half the going rate uh, based on an enterprise. Uh, value per ounce in the ground than the, the peers, uh, and that's not including that one million ounce that we expect to come in from Undundu. So it's it's just going to get cheaper, and it just kind of says to us that maybe the market's kind of missing the mark here on, on especially on Undundu. Maybe they don't uh, realize that's coming. Uh, so we'll look for that uh, in the relative near term in the next uh, couple of weeks, and then. Uh, you know, just to kind of put things in perspective, yes, it's it's down. Oh, you know, it's down. It's down to about 23% year to date, uh, but that's actually not too bad compared to the uh, Vanek Junior Gold Miners ETF, which is off about 36%. So, uh, just to put things into perspective there, and just all the development uh, stage projects right now are kind of out of favor with uh, with in the current economic environment. So, uh, that's it on Osino. So we'll move ahead to uh, the other top pick is Pan Global Resources, again, a returning name. And again, uh, you know, catalyst laden uh, story here. Uh, news flow, you know, has been slow, slower than we had expected in, the, in previous quarters, but now things uh, we expect to pick up uh, through the balance of the year. They just announced uh, a large 40, 40 hole program at their Escasina project in Spain's Iberian Pirate Belt. And you'll recall that's that's the place to be for the these VMS deposits that the company's targeting. Uh, they've been mining there literally since the, the Roman era. So uh, a great heritage there. Their project is sandwiched between about four or five mines. Uh, literally, we were there in April and it was just kind of surreal driving around the area with just mines everywhere. Uh, and these guys sandwiched right in the middle of it all. So. Uh, looking forward to some some better news flow coming uh, during the balance of the year, like I said. Um, so they have the La Romana, which is the flag, flagship discovery there. Oh, north of 120 holes into it, still haven't missed. It's still growing. And that's kind of your backstop for the valuation, which is currently around 90 million bucks uh, Canadian market cap. Um, you know, we had some M&A in the copper space this morning with uh, Harmony Gold picking up a, a, a copper asset in Western Australia, and based on the price they paid, that basically with what we think Pan Global has at, at uh, La Romana, that backstops the valuation. It's right in line there with what we think they have. So, you know, basically you're not getting, you're not having any expiration uh, upside priced into the story here. And that's really what the story is all about. La Romana will get incrementally bigger as they drill, they eventually run out, but they've got you know, a dozen lookalike targets on their project. And they're finally starting to get into the, into those now. They'll test eight, uh, 80, uh, sorry, a 40 hole program uh, just ramping up. So looking for more discoveries just to build out the min mineral inventory there. And and the neighbors certainly have to be uh, keenly aware of what's going on there. It's, uh, it's a relatively high profile discovery uh, and they'll just continue to flesh it, flesh it out. So that's, uh, that's the thesis on Pan Global, and with that, I will turn it over to my partner in crime, Gabriel, for his uh, topics. Thanks very much, Ryan. So I'm also keeping with my uh, same two picks from last quarter, the first being Global Resources. Uh, I originally included Global in the topics portfolio last quarter because it has among the best resource growth and project development profiles in the primary silver developer space. Um, Los Ricos North and South, uh, the projects currently contain about uh, 240 million ounces of silver equivalent and uh, visibility on delivering about uh, uh, another 100 million ounces over the next three to six months is there. So uh, I think this is outstanding considering that most silver development uh, companies really struggle to deliver uh, 50 million ounces of silver equivalent just to begin with. 
Um, in this market, uh, what Gold also has in its favor is uh, US $74 million in cash and equivalents and a small tailings reprocessing operation that generates enough cash to pay for GNA and also a bit of exploration. Uh, and that's so uh, that makes it a bit more of a, a defensive name among junior developers that uh, typically have to rely on outside capital to fund their uh, operations. Uh, I should also point out that the company has a, a long track record of finding, developing, and operating and selling assets in Mexico. Uh, so last quarter's performance was lackluster. It returned negative uh, 22.9% compared to the uh, global X silver miner ETF return of uh, six minus 6.9%. Um, I think the, the lack, lackluster performance was largely driven by selling pressure uh, as uh, specialists and quant funds were speculating on gold gold's falling market cap and whether it was going to remain in the GDX uh, ETF or not. And so that put selling pressure on the, the company uh, as we saw in the quarter. Uh, having said that, the fundamental story of resource growth and project development for the company remains intact. Um, in terms of Catalyst, I expect we'll deliver another 100 million ounces in about uh, three to six months, uh, which is pretty significant. And uh, we will also get the Los Ricos South pre-feasibility study, which is underway. And uh, I think that will be positive for the story. Um, and lastly, consolidation of additional concessions around the Los Ricos concessions uh, could also be positive developments for the company as well. Uh, just on valuation, uh, it's premium over the silver developer peer average has been cut by about 50%. Uh, over this performance in uh, Q2. Um, so they're trading right now at about 90 cents per ounce of silver equivalent versus a peer group average of about 56 cents. And if you include the 100 million ounces that I think they'll be adding uh, in short order, that number falls to 68. So very compelling, I think, in terms of uh, valuation. Um, having said that, I'll move on to SilverX mining. Um, SilverX has been another one of my top picks now for the third consecutive quarter, uh, given the expected ramp up in production at the company's Nueva Recuperada project in Peru. Uh, ramp up was slower than I initially expected through to Q2 of uh, this year, but it has since begun making strides and is now producing the expected 1.8 to 2 million uh, ounces of silver equivalent uh, per year run rate. Um, it, this is still early days in the company, but I expect it will eventually grow to about uh, five to six million ounces of production per year uh, in about 2024 to 25. Uh, in terms of share performance, SilverX was a positive performer in our portfolio last quarter. Uh, it returned 7.3%, uh, again, compared to Global X Silver Miners' return of about uh, minus 6.9%. And I think this is in growing recognition that the company has turned the corner on the production ramp up and we should be getting stable production uh, going forward. For catalysts, uh, the company is expected to deliver the initial PEA on the project, which will provide uh, better estimates uh, for production and costs than what we've been working with uh, so far. Uh, I think that will improve investor confidence in the story. Exploration is an ongoing part of the project as well, uh, with good gold potential being demonstrated at the project, uh, certainly more so than the company initially uh, expected. And they've also been getting good recoveries on that gold. So that's been additive to the company. Um, and also in this quarter, the company is expected to submit the environmental and social impact assessment on an expansion of production from the current 720 ton per day run rate to uh, 2,500 tons per day. And uh, that will signal to the market that this is a company that is serious about growth and becoming a relevant name in the junior silver producer space. In terms of valuation, the company trades at just 0.1 times my NAV estimate. Uh, that's compared to the sub 100 million market cap silver producer average of about 0.3 times. And on an EV per ounce basis, it trades at just 15 cents per ounce uh, versus the non-producer exploration and developer average of 56 cents and the sub 100 million market cap producer average of 60 cents per ounce. So very compelling valuation in my opinion. Um, these are, as I pointed out, early days, uh, but the company uh, could be compared to an early Fortuna silver mines, which grew out of a similar sized asset in Peru uh, into a multi-billion dollar mining company. And uh, just one last word is that uh, while this has been a tough market for silver mining, uh, I point to Silver's role in uh, electronics, EVs, and photovoltaics as a growing source of green energy demand to support its uh, Silver's industrial demand over the medium to the longer term. Uh, so I think there's a good foundation for Silver's industrial demand uh, in 
the medium to longer term. So I'll uh, leave it at that and turn the call uh, discussion back to Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And before we turn to uh, questions, we did want to do a bit of a uh, shout out to uh, Tom Hems, who is on the call, on the job in Calgary. And we look for Tom to be a significant contributor to the portfolio with the uh, Q1 portfolio going out next year. So Tom, welcome to the call. Well, thanks a lot, Rob. Excited to be part of the team and hopefully uh, you know, add to the success of this portfolio. Hopefully we weren't too subtle in terms of putting the, the pressure on your contribution to the performance. Oh, big, big shoes to fill and uh, everyone's done great. So I, I hope I can do the same. <laughs> We're sure you will. <laughs> We've missed out on uh, some of the oil exposure for the year to date. That will change. Now on the uh, questions, uh, we have a question for David um, on the real estate front. Um, can you compare... Uh, BSR versus Dream, to similar stocks. And thank you for the question, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. And, um, you know, j- just I'll, I'll, you know, preface this by saying that we do not cover Dream Residential at the moment. Um, but, you know, l- l- looking at the portfolio, which I have physically toured and, um, and using consensus estimates, the way I would position the two companies or maybe the way I position Dream Residential even within my top picks or you know, b- between the two that we've discussed, um, it would fall in between uh, flagship and BSR. It trades very cheap on consensus multiples at 12 times forward cash flow. The quality of the portfolio would be inferior to BSR. So it would be much closer to workforce housing. I would say it's a more defensive portfolio in that the rents are cheaper, the properties are less shiny, um, and the valuation screen's obviously much cheaper. Thank you, David. And I'll ask another question of Gabriel before turning the questions back to uh, Amber. Gabriel, you, you, you made reference to the tough market conditions. Do you see that leading to a consolidation of names or how do you see your, your companies, your space working its way through this? Um, yeah, that, that's a very good question. So um, in, in a lot of the discussions I've been having with CEOs, uh, they, they are very mindful of the, the scarcity of capital and the need to potentially consolidate. Uh, so we're not just talking about um, larger companies swallowing smaller companies. Um, what I'm actually seeing with these discussions with these CEOs is smaller companies coming together, uh, thinking about the, the synergies that they have, uh, be it uh, different uh, projects in different points in time in the development curve and uh, being able to leverage a, a sort of a combined or combination of that pipeline and of that growth curve um, into uh, having enough scale to attract capital uh, in this market. Uh, so it, it is very much a discussion that that is being driven from the grassroots up. And uh, certainly, yes, I think there are good opportunities um, as always particularly for companies with, with good projects and good jurisdictions. Uh, but uh, I think given market conditions, that is uh, definitely going to be a theme that is going to be uh, uh, noted going forward, uh, at least in the short to medium term. Cool, great. Maybe if we stick with the, the resource space, Ryan, um, resource development stories are out of favor right now. Uh, why do you still like Ocino and Pan Global? No, I mean, it's no secret uh, they're, they're out of favor. But look, I think both projects... You know they're compelling enough that uh, that you know coming out. You know when I mentioned Osino and in, in, during the call, I think it's it's set up nicely for what we see as a as a new bull market in gold uh, coming. You know whether whether it's you know a recession, the, the Fed a Fed induced recession, gold typically does well in that kind of environment. And then you know what kind of appetite does the the Fed have have to let that continue? I mean you see you know if you look at past cycles, recession spurred on by, by raising rates. Uh, and then they start cutting. And that's when gold really takes off is when they start cutting rates. So you know, just, just love how Osino is, is kind of positioned ahead of that. And like I said, if, if that doesn't happen, I think it's a scale of a project that that management team could take on uh, themselves. And then on the pan global side, you know, your, your valuation right now is it's off, obviously, uh, but it's backstopped by what we can see, and they don't have a resource estimate out yet at La Romana, but basically on what we can see on, on the drilling they've done and the geometry of, 
of the zone so far. You know, the valuation is backstopped by that. So, you know, just given the, the outlook for copper and the whole green transition going on, is there downside uh, possible? Yes, but I think it, it should be relatively limited. And the upside, I mean, just as far as metal prices there and then this expiration uh, upside that they're finally kind of getting into in a concerted way, uh, really, I think outweighs that. So that, that's why they're still hot picks. Awesome. Um, Andrew, um, you know, like with the recent negative publicity on a lot of cannabis stores in Canada, can you speak to the current timing and rationale of adding high tide to the top X portfolio? Sure. So, yes, there has been a lot of press on the Canadian retail industry. We're seeing articles about too many stores in Ontario, too many stores in Canada, stores closing. Uh, we've seen a pub couple uh, publicly traded retailers um, file for CCAA protection. Um, so it has been tough um, on the industry. However, it's been high tide that's been the group tightening the screw. And, and so it's really high tide leading this pressure with their discount club model. Um, about 70 to 80% of the retailers in this country, the stores in this country are owned by independent retailers. They don't have the balance sheet capacity to respond. And as high tide continues to pressure the industry with its aggressive pricing, uh, it opens the door for new m and uh, opportunities at very attractive multiples. Um, secondly, the company has recently added about $30 million of capital to its balance sheet. Uh, so it's further buttressed um, its balance sheet, which, which it will use to um, further advance this discount club strategy and place, and place pressures on private companies. So it's really high tight tightening the screws. And as you hear about pressures faced by other retailers, um, a good deal of that is owed to high tide success. Awesome. Uh, Rob, a, a simple question, but maybe a hard one. You've got three top picks. Which one do you pick? Whenever anyone starts off with a simple question, I usually you know head for the exits, right? <laughs> um, across the three names, I would submit Converge um, as the top pick. And I could say, you know, there are 15 reasons why. And that's a 15% free cash flow yield on the share, right? That financial flexibility gives the company so many options to trigger outperformance, be that a more aggressive share repurchase, be that a dividend, be that an acquisition where they're 35 in with a spotless track record and advantages of greater and greater scale with every time they step up to make another deal. So, you know, if you ask, what is your favorite child? Um, I would say go with the, uh, the biggest um, and that with the free cash flow. Um, now, while I've got the floor, I might just turn, if we could turn to slide 21, I had a question on diagnose. Sorry, Amber, did I answer your question? Sure. Stick with the largest one. <laughs> and so on slide 21, where we have diagnose, um, Stefan, you know, clearly the Essilor Luxottica is a, a key catalyst here. Can you talk to how that has been reflected in the chart? And in terms of looking forward, you know, are, can you talk to the risk return about, you know, deferral of announcement or um, terms of announcement and how that may influence the share price? Yeah, the chart actually is uh, reflective of the, I would say the small cap healthcare space in Canada. So there's, there's actually nothing about this chart that's a, a, an aberration. So I, I, I think it's actually down kind of in line <laughs> with the average uh, healthcare stock. I, I don't know the exact, um, but the, the sort of the THX healthcare index uh, is down 50 plus percent um year to date uh and that's a longer term chart than that so um th that's largely you know i would say sector uh related in terms of the essilor deal um you know when they came out with the mou the stock didn't really pop on that news uh because you know it's just an mou it's not a contract and you know th this is a story 
it's been uh, you know a, a long time in, in, in gaining traction commercially. So I think people were, were relatively skeptical. So it sort of drifted lower on that. Um, despite it, but j- just to put it in context, you know, it's simple math on what um, a contract with Essilor could be, you know, it, it's 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 really a potential staggering upside for the, for the company. It, could be, it would be a multi-bagger if they could execute on uh, a deal with such a large player in the space, and it would certainly validate them, you know, for every other potential retailer in the world in, in the optical space. And there's qu- quite a bit of the market is the independent uh, optical retailers as well, because it, it means that they have the gold standard for the industry. So, uh, you know, that, that's all I can really say about uh, the valuation. The, the other thing I would say about the diagnosis is that, you know, this is a bit of an orphan company in Canada. Um, it's, you know, it's early stage, but one of its sort of U.S. competitors, uh, a company called IDX, it's private, and they just raised $75 million US uh, with a technology that is uh, probably less proven out than than diagnosed in terms of commercial traction. So, uh, you know, they really do have um, a very interesting technology that, you know, somehow over time will, will, uh, will, 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 will surface is my, is my, is my view on it. Thanks. And Amber, I'll do my best for a, a simple but challenging question for you. Um, you know, as I'm using less paper, um, can you talk to the growth profile for Ready Shred in an environment where people do uh, use less paper? Um, I mean, it's true. We, we've been using less paper for the last 20 years. Uh, yet the company's been growing organic growth quarter in, quarter out. Um, the reason being, um, there are regulatory tailwinds in the way we handle client paperwork. And even if we're printing less, the use of shredding is actually increasing. Um, The second part of the organic growth story is the company has a growing scanning business where they scan, index, and upload the paperwork into uh, a cloud server before shredding it. Um, And that's growing like gangbusters. And they've also got an e-waste business uh, where they shred electronics and that's also a very high growth vertical. Um, so extremely comfortable with the growth profile. And just as a reminder, the company grew sales from $20 million three years ago to $50 million today. And we think they can do or hit the $100 million mark in three to four years. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, you know, we would like to thank everyone for their interest, their attention. We would like to make ourselves... Um, available to any follow-up questions uh, with respect to the names as mentioned within the portfolio or within our broader coverage. Uh, So with that, we extend our thanks. We extend our wishes for better market conditions.